Thanks. Hello. Uh, so just to get this right off, my name is Sean Coates, as you mentioned. Just to get this right out of the way at the start, I don't work for Amazon. Amazon doesn't pay me. There's no Amazon friendly stuff going on. I'm just a customer, but I'm a happy customer and wanted to share with you about um, using Zappa to deploy your apps onto the service they have called Lambda, which we're going to talk about. Um, but this talk is really kind of about like deploying serverless Python in, in that infrastructure. Um, so serverless is kind of a buzzword now. Um, some people have a real problem with it, but what serverless really means is that you don't have any permanent servers. So obviously we have servers that run our code, but we don't have any servers that you know, stick around past the end of the request. Um, and Lambda is a service within Amazon Web Services that allows you to run arbitrary event-driven code. Um, for the past couple of years, we've been able to run Python there. For about a year now, we've been able to run Python 3 there um, before it was like a Java and C-sharp service. Um, and you can run just completely arbitrary stuff there. Um, API Gateway is a service that turns HTTP or HTTPS requests into events that Lambda can consume. So we'll look, take a quick look at how that works together a little bit. Um, so the user or the browser makes a request uh, to like your domain name or your host name, uh, and it goes off to CloudFront kind of transparently to the user. That goes through gate API Gateway. Um, that turns it into an event. Lambda consumes the event. And then the interesting part for what we're going to talk about happens where Zappa, Zappa receives the event and turns it, into, um, turns it into WSGI that your app probably already knows how to speak if you, do, if you have a Flask or a Django app or other WSGI stack apps. So why would you want to do this? Well, lots of reasons. Um, for, for me, one of them is that it's very inexpensive. Um, you, uh, that's inexpensive with a star because if you have a very large app, it could eventually be very, very expensive to do so. At some point, you probably will. If you were trying to run like Facebook on uh, Lambda, you would just you would spend way more money than Facebook currently spends on their infrastructure. Um, this is the price per gigabyte second of time, and that's how they bill you. So you, you pay per request like a very tiny amount per like batch of requests, but the way they bill you is in gigabyte seconds, which means that if your app consumes half a gigabyte of RAM and runs for two seconds, this is the amount you would pay. So one one thousandth of a cent. Um, most of your apps probably don't require half a gigabyte of RAM to satisfy a web request, and most of them probably don't run for two seconds, I would hope. Everyone nod, yes, not two seconds. Uh, quick apps um, save you money, so there's a, performance, there's a performance benefit that is actually directly tied to how much you spend on the service. Um, and there's also a free tier, so Amazon has a tier where really small apps can run uh, in a, a service, or sorry, in a tier that they don't even bill you for, for the first year. So you can try it out and see if you like it and see if you can deploy an app there. It also really helps with capacity planning. So in a traditional kind of distributed environment or a, tr a traditional um, uh, high availability environment, you have servers just sitting around waiting for requests and maybe never get them. You have servers waiting for like the load balancer to hit them up and they're just waiting most of the time, hopefully, because you don't ever want to be running really close to your, major, your, your highest capacity because you'll run out of requests if you ever get a spike from like, I don't know, CNN or something like that. So it, it kind of really helps with capacity planning in that you don't have servers sitting around. You only pay for the ones you're using. So they're always sitting around and they're not, you're not being billed for them. You only get billed for that gigabyte second of time that your request happens during, uh, your, your request happens in. Um, and the default concurrency in US East 1 is 3,000. So that means you can spin up 3,000 as if you had 3,000 NGINXs running. Um, and it kind of passes it off. It's more like 3,000 threads running in an NGINX, but it's effectively the same thing for purposes. And you can request for the purposes of your app, and you can request to increase that from support. So we currently have on our app um, like a default or a concurrency of 10,000 for our, for our biggest app. So they have no problem just cranking that number up as long as you seem like you know what you're doing and are paying your bills properly. Um, it also helps with ops and administration. So it kind of turns your your ops people into straight up DevOps people. There's not a whole lot of like server maintenance going on. You don't have to do the boring parts of ops. Um, I'm an ops guy mostly and like updating packages and security patches and like making sure that the users are synced up between servers and all the stuff that goes along with that. All those things are super boring as far as I'm concerned. I'd much rather do the app stuff. The app stuff is what we really care about. So that brings everyone into kind of like a DevOps, DevOps setting. So Amazon takes care of all these things for you. you know, it does package updates, security patching, um, manages the instances for you. It also takes care of load balancing, auto scaling um, when you're, when you're like, if one of these containers that your Lambda is running on fails, it'll, it'll create a new one for you. It does a failover for you automatically. So where does Zappa come in? Well, 
There are other frameworks that allow you to deploy serverless. You can upload in, a, in the console in Amazon. You can just type some Python into a text box and you can run that code in Lambda. But it's kind of a pain to manage all of the parts of like hooking it up the API gateway, and managing versions, and uploading bigger stuff to S3. And that's where Zappa helps. But what's really interesting about Zappa is that it uses existing apps. So how many people in here have either a Flask or Django app? So probably like a little over half, I would say. For the most part, you could probably put your app into a Zappa deployment without very much work at all. And we'll, we'll go through like a really simple version of that later in the talk, which is running out. Um, but uh, the beauty is that it just makes your app speak. It turns the event into whiskey, and your app already knows how to speak that. So Zappa takes care of all the other parts that you need to deploy your app for the most part um, on the Amazon side. So like. Uh, permissions through IAM, it creates the S3 bucket, it does, uh, like, hooks it up to HPI gateway and manages your custom domain name, all that kind of stuff. Um, and it also takes care of some non-infrastructure, non non-Amazon um, app stuff, I like to call it, which is like pack packaging up the virtual environment and zipping up your code and uploading it and um, taking care of making sure that the Lambda is hooked up to API gateway and, and those kinds of things that are kind of not really infrastructure, they're kind of like things that your app needs to do. So. Let's look at how Zappa does it. You need two things to get started with Zappa, really. You need a virtual environment or an active, active virtual environment. Um, and it does work with PyEnv. I just don't use it, so I can't really speak to that, but other people definitely use it. Um, and you just need to install Zappa. Uh, and as I mentioned, you use your existing app. So here's the Flask Quick Start app that most people who use Flask have probably seen many times. Every time you're starting a new thing, you just copy it and you go from there. Um, so this is like the one screen, here's a Flask app kind of thing. I um, mean, you can do the same thing with Django. I, I'm not a Django guy, but I um, like installed Django yesterday and did this, and it, and it worked. So all I had to do was adjust my allowed hosts because there's like a weird thing where it comes from API gateway instead of local hosts. So Django guys probably already know that part. Um, Django people. Um, so uh, the first thing you need to do when you're using Zappa to actually start using it is to get a Zappa settings file, and that is uh, to tell Zappa you know where to deploy and how to do it. So I don't expect people to read this, but I just wanted to show that it's super simple. So you do Zappa init, which is the first line, and then there's like a bunch of stuff that I just press enter a whole bunch of times for. Um, and the default was perfect for this thing. My actual Zappa settings file for our big app is, is pretty long. It does a whole bunch of different things, but to, to demonstrate like the simplicity of, of getting it running, super easy just to run through this first screen, second screen, that's it. And then you get this Zappa settings file. So it's a few lines. Some of them look like they aren't even necessary, like the, the null lines probably aren't actually necessary, but this is what you get from Zappa init. Um, and we can use this to do a deployment. So here's a screencast I made because I am a chicken about doing live stuff during talks because it's, it's, uh, it's burned me before. So this is real time. This is a real time recording of a screencast I did from the speaker's room about an hour and a half ago. So, I did Zappa deploy, it takes the app code, zips it up, figures out what your virtual environment is, puts it into the package, creates a CloudFormation template, dumps it onto, uh, dumps the code onto S3, tells CloudFormation, go for it, and then it sits here and waits for the CloudFormation stack to form, which it's doing, and like 26 seconds, I think, is the length of the video, we have um, a deployment on uh, an HTTPS endpoint that you see at the bottom there. So that's all there is to it. Um, Obviously, more complicated apps are gonna be a little more difficult, but that app that I just showed you is the code that's running at that URL right now. Um, and you see that it's like a, an Amazon AWS.com URL. You can actually hook up your custom domain name to it, so we won't get into that in this talk because we will run out of time, but you can just put it on a regular domain name. You don't need to run it on Amazon stuff directly. Um, so we deployed it. We have an app that we've deployed. So. Obviously, deploying is easy and maintaining is hard if people have been maintaining apps for a while. Um, Zappa has a mechanism for that, too. So you do Zappa update instead of Zappa deploy, and what that does is it takes your current, like what Zappa can currently see and does the same things to it, but instead of creating like new API gateway, it hooks up the new set of code to the existing API gateway. So it's kind of like a, it's like a, a, a you know, just it, it updates what's on, what's on the environment. Um, and you probably also wanna do some log tailing in case anything goes wrong. So uh, it hooks up, Zappa hooks up your app's standard output and standard error to um, CloudWatch logs, and that interface is a little bit unwieldy in the console, um, but Zappa makes it easy with a tail function that works very similar to like a regular log tail. Um, and there's like other things you can do. You can say like in the last hour, or you can say like show me a certain time period, that kind of stuff. 
Um, so really quickly, Zappa does a bunch of other things. You can hook it up to like a scheduling mechanism. Uh, you can monitor like DynamoDB changes, which is Amazon's um, uh, document database or NoSQL database. You can monitor Kinesis streams. Uh, you can like fire an event when someone uploads a file to S3, for example, if you wanted to do like a transcoding or if you wanted to resize images, that kind of stuff. Uh, you can listen on an SNS queue and listen to messages there. Um, and there's a few other things that it does, like it'll handle rollbacks for you. You can do fan out through a mechanism where you can have Zappa call Zappa, but you can have it call like other Zappas. So it, like your app will call its own, a function within the app through a decorator and it will actually call another um, Lambda instance of your app. So a bunch of things there. And that is the quickest introduction to Zappa anyone has ever seen. So uh, you can email me there or you can hit me up on Twitter and I'm gonna be in the back for questions if anyone needs anything. Thank you.